Murphy, as you said, it's 10 o'clock. We'll go ahead and call this meeting to order of uh, the curriculum and instruction uh, committee meeting. Uh, today is April 10th, 2024. And our first item on the uh, agenda is the meeting agenda. <laughs> um, is there any uh, comment on that? Okay. I'll just note that we have three three main items that we'll be covering: um, multi-tiered uh, student support services, and um, uh, we're going to be talking about our virtual school and uh, media updates. Not in that order. And the next thing we have is: there any public comment? I do not believe we've had anyone sign up for public comment. Uh, okay. Did want to let you know that it. Um, we do have a member of the public who's joined the meeting. Okay. And I'll just, I'll give a moment for whoever that might be who has joined to have an opportunity to raise their hand. This is a, a public meeting and I want to make sure we're uh, available to accept any public comment. Okay, seeing no no indication of uh, any member of the public desiring to speak in front of the curriculum instruction committee, I would like to then uh, bring up that we have the minutes, the draft minutes from the March 13th meeting. Um, they are up there. We don't vote on them, but I have read through them and have no uh, corrections or changes. Any, uh, any members of the team have uh, any feedback on the minutes? Otherwise, we'll let them stand. They look accurate to me. Okay. All right, next item, we have uh, board member comments. Uh, I'll, Mr. Mr. Bass, you're up first. I'll just, uh, <laughs> on my screen, so I'll just start with you if you have any board member comments. No comments from me today. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Mr. J? Uh, none at this time. Thank you. Okay. And uh, I, I have none myself. Okay. So there we go. Uh, then that will take us up to our first agenda item, uh, multi-tiered system of supports. Dr. Thanks, Ms. Johnson. And I'll just get us started this morning. Um, again, Scott Murphy, Director of Curriculum Instruction Innovation, and just wanted to frame all three topics today. Um, as you've heard throughout the year within this committee, we've been talking a lot about opportunities for students, um, access, access to courses, pathways, college and career readiness. Um, today's a lot about support. T today's a lot about the supports that students have access to, and particularly when we see that they're not on track um, how we mobilize supports for students to make sure that they are, as well as some of the other um, sort of elements in a well-rounded curriculum you'll hear about in the um, media update. So um, just wanted to frame that for today's conversation around uh, really the support pathways that we have available and implement systematically for students. So with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Vetter um, to begin the, the first presentation, and that team will then introduce themselves. Good morning, everybody. Let me pull up the slideshow for today. Again, Frank Vetter, Director of Assessment, Data Reporting and Strategic Improvement. And typically I come before you to present information about our key performance indicators, but um, of the many responsibilities that we have on my team, um, the intervention team is, a, is, a, is an important part of it. And so today we're gonna talk about that. I'm not sure why this isn't, oh, here we go. Let's see. Great. Okay. So we are set. So let me introduce the, uh, the wonderful members of the intervention team, beginning with our supervisor of local assessment and intervention, Kelly Denty. Hi, everyone. And then our uh, math intervention teacher specialist is uh, Jennifer Fleming. Good morning, everyone. And Brittany Garst is our reading intervention teacher specialist. Brittany, did you want to introduce yourself? Sorry, my microphone was. Morning, That's everyone. And uh, and finally, we have um, we have uh, Maggie Hawk, who um, works with Tier Three Reading Intervention. Good morning. All right, wonderful. All right, so MTSS. So it's important to note that MTSS is a whole child approach. And when school teams meet, they monitor a variety of data points to determine who may need more support. 
Many teams review attendance and discipline data weekly, as well as the results of recently administered uh, universal screeners, such as iReady for math or Dibbles for reading. And schools understand how inextricably linked emotional well being is to learning, so they explore data on the whole child. However, for today's conversation, we're going to be focusing on the academic components of MTSS. So MTSS is a three-tier model with tier one entailing what happens in a student's core program classroom and tier three indicating the most significant level of support. Specially designed instruction, which involves adapting to meet the specific learning needs of students, occurs at all three levels. Tier one begins with ensuring evidence-informed instruction using high quality instructional materials and monitoring student progress on a regular basis. When students demonstrate a need for additional support, supplemental instruction is given in the core classroom. When initial supplemental instruction is not effective at helping students make sufficient progress in tier one classroom, or assessment results indicate greater needs, a tier two intervention is assigned to students. Again, frequent progress monitoring is essential here. Finally, when tier two is not sufficient to meet student needs, or again, when assessment data indicate a need for greater support, a tier three intervention is given. Typically students in a tier three intervention will need several years of support at this level to learn grade level skills. And now I'm going to turn it over to our supervisor of local assessment and intervention, Kelly Denti. Good morning again. I wanted to um, first talk about uh, how we make the decisions for the support pathways that our students receive. And, and we highly value um, looking at multiple data points and doing so in a collaborative structure. And so we really, in every school building, we have three um, main teams that meet that kind of help this process along. The first is the accelerated learning process, which I know we've talked to the CNI uh, committee about, and that is really the classroom level assessment data that's analyzed by a team of professionals that are teaching the same content um, and they're looking at student need and student strength to then design instruction together and of course at those meetings we may have um, some needs that rise to the surface um, students who um, have additional supports that that the uh, teachers are recommending based on their progress and so from there we have what's called a core team and the core team is looking at academic supports that go beyond the classroom and so they they would be looking at multiple sources of data, um, kind of determining what's the what's the student's history been? Um, are they new to SCPS? What additional assessments uh, might need to be gathered? What data might, needs to be gathered from additional diagnostic? Uh, uh, drill in assessments. And so then they would make um, determinations about students programming from there within the MTSS. That's also the team that would look regularly at the progress monitoring data to determine whether students are uh, making uh, adequate growth. And um, then from there, we have a, a larger team, the student services team or MTSS team. And that is really kind of that whole child look at coordinating services that go across attendance, discipline, grades. So I know today we're focusing mostly on the academic supports, but we do have that that larger collaborative team that kind of makes those decisions. Um, so that's that's kind of how we go about the, the process. And then what we'll do first is we'll kind of show you um, our math interventions and some evidence of effectiveness, and then we'll move into reading. So for mathematics intervention, um, you can see that we have intervention atten intensity kind of increasing across grade levels K through five. Um, this is sort of a snapshot of what we have available 
to us. Um, and, and as Frank was saying, that we um, we kind of start with that tier one classroom support, high quality differentiated instruction for our students, um, and can move into more supplemental supports as needed, monitoring progress as we go. Schools would determine which additional intensive programs might be needed in addition to that core programming based on what the evidence is telling us. And so you can see those other programs. For secondary, um, we have what you see here is actually what um, we will have next year. There's one, one change um, that we have this year where you see math readiness for grades 6, 7, and, and 8. That's the program we're using next year. We are sunsetting um, math workshop in, a, in its place. Um, math workshop, we found that the students really fell into kind of two categories. We had those who needed just minimal support working just below grade level, um, and our new core program in math actually has um, some really robust supports to be able to kind of scoop those kids up and accelerate their learning to grade level within that core class, which is wonderful because it, it gives the kids back an elective. Um, and then there were was another category uh, where the child might need more significant supports. They're working further below grade level and they need um, more of a strategic multi-sensory approach to math um, and early numeracy instruction. And so the new program program is um, math readiness and it is a multi-year accelerated approach sixth through eighth grade that's closing skill gaps and preparing students for readiness for algebra in ninth grade. Um, and so that investment in, in time and that intensive instruction is really geared to kind of get them back on track for that learning journey um, and towards college and career readiness. And um, we currently have some schools that are doing that in addition to um, we, we, we did some schools we implemented this year. It was very successful. Next year, we're going to all middle schools for that. Um, and then some of our schools are um, looking at that as a standalone course to, um, to then get kids ready for um, the grade level standards, but also to have access to um, another elective. And then in terms of evidence of effectiveness, um, we're using in grades one through eight for students receiving intervention iReady math to measure growth. Just to let you know, historically, we had uh, kind of looked at the percentage of students who were making growth at all. Um, and we found that it was much more effective to hone in on one particular stretch growth target that iReady provides, um, which will really help us ensure whether students are making adequate progress. The stretch growth target is um, aspirational, but attainable. So it's possible for students to, and they, and they need to really work towards that target, um, but it is it really is challenging enough that um, that's the goal students should be working at multiple years in a row in order to get back to grade level. And so here you can see um, we just captured the growth for the first semester last year and then the first semester this year for those students receiving intervention. Um, we did want to point out that we have um, new core programming in grades three through five and six through eight, and it's a mastery curriculum. So it's not cyclical, um, which is especially in three through five, what we have been used to. And students are kind of seeing those standards in more of a linear progression. So we are anticipating that we'll see greater growth from middle of year to end of year um, this year. And so we'll be analyzing that second half of the year data to kind of see what adjustments need to be made for, for next year. For um, high school, we look at a, a different assessment. Um, this is a newer assessment that's tied to our core programming and, and that Alex um, measures topics mastered towards completion of the course. Um, and so students need a certain percentage of passing those topics in order for it to be considered mastered. Um, and we would really be looking mid-year for students to be in that middle band of, uh, we want them to be at about 50%. So that 35 to 59% range is where really where we'd be looking for those students that are in our year-long algebra intervention. 
that's where we would want them. So we have seen some gains. You can see this year we have more kids in that middle band and fewer kids in that zero to 14 percent range. This was really the first year that we had um, more fidelity requirements for this assessment and so um, we're kind of interested to see where we go from here. Uh, initially we're getting a really good sense that this is a, a strong indicator of MCAP success but we're going to be doing some internal studies to kind of look at that correlation. Um, um, and, and then kind of do some um, looking at the ranges to make sure that we know the target for where we want students to be mid-year. Um, moving into reading, we have universal screening um, at every grade level. So I know we're required by the state to have it in K through three, but in FCPS, we really value making sure we have screening measures for every student. Um, last year, we did a screener of students um, census-wide every grade level because we knew coming out of the pandemic, we really needed to make sure we knew where students were and make sure that no one slipped through the cracks. Um, and so uh, Dibbles is our universal screener for grades K through three. And then the um, oral reading fluency part of Dibbles along with iReady, our reading diagnostic is used at grades four and five for grades six through 10. We use iReady um, and then anytime we're using a, a comprehension measure, even though iReady does have some foundational components, it's primarily measuring their grade level proficiency with comprehension once they're past a certain grade level. Um, that's sort of an indicator that we need to do additional drill in measures. So we have other, um, other measures like the oral reading fluency or the quick phonics uh, screener that would help us determine when a student has foundational needs. And then we're also kind of analyzing, you know, do we have students new to FCPS that didn't have those measures and, and um, meeting those screening needs um, when we see them. Our reading intervention programming um, is, is presented the same way as math, where you can see the increasing intensity across grade level. Um, we offer interventions for the skills that students need at that moment. And so we first address foundational reading needs, then we would address fluency and comprehension because the students do need that, um, the skill and the automaticity with foundational reading skills before they can focus on fluency and comprehension. We have a sliding scale of intensity for these interventions. Um, we intervene with the, the least intensive first, and when students aren't making progress, we increase intensity there. Um, our teachers have really high quality tier one supports that they're using, and um, then if writing becomes a concern, we also have, um, um, we kind of differentiate if they're working on, uh, they, they struggle because they have some motor skill issues, then it might be working with an occupational therapist. Um, if the writing difficulty is language-based, then, um, and it needs to be beyond what's provided within our structured literacy programming, um, then our special education department has um, a new resource, a uh, bank of strategies that they're training teachers on called paragraphology. Um, and that would be included in students' specially designed instruction as needed. Um, so it's really important to note here, there's no quick fix for reading, and, and um, we'll talk about that a little when we get to the growth, but it really is important for us to begin with the foundational literacy um, as we learn to read before we read to learn. And um, then for secondary, we... Um, have the same progression of skills. Next year, two of our reading comprehension programs are also adding strategic supports for students that do not have all of their foundational literacy skills, but they don't need the intensity of a structured literacy program. So perhaps for a student that has been in language foundations or OG+, they've exited the program, but they might need ongoing um, targeted skill support our comprehension interventions will allow them to continue gaining fluency with those skills in order to support comprehension. So that's an exciting development. And then um, we have some new programming coming from our special education department. Visualizing and verbalizing um, is um, currently where we've started training for that. And um, it really helps students who are unable to or struggle to create an image while they're reading. And um, it helps them to create not only the image from the language to be able to then also verbalize it and express what they're reading or what they're seeing as they're reading. And then those skills are, um, 
developed to better support comprehension and higher order thinking and reading comprehension. Talkies is a similar program. It's sort of the primer to visualizing and verbalizing, and that is designed for students that need smaller, simpler steps to be able to create that imagery and language connection. And then, as I mentioned, paragraphology is a system of strategies that would um, help students uh, support their writing and their note taking. And it can take students from, um, it teaches them a, a systematic formula um, to write something as basic as a paragraph, but they can work all the way up to a five paragraph essay. Um, and that training will begin in the fall. As we look at evidence of um, effectiveness, just a, a few notes about this data set. Our students in kindergarten are provided various levels of supplemental instruction for the first half of the year before they're identified for more intensive intervention at mid-year. And so therefore the kindergartners are not included in this data set. So we're just looking at grades one through three. Um, and the cut score for the benchmark for Dibbles, their, their benchmark readiness level is going to increase each window. So here we do have some students that are um, making significant growth, but they haven't increased a performance level yet. So it really takes making that growth for several semesters in a row before you're going to start to see the, the level, the performance levels increase. One of our team goals has been earlier identification um, of, for students and more appropriate program placement. So I think those gains that you're seeing there for the primary grades, um, we're starting to see some fruits of those efforts to, to try to get um, to students sooner. And then um, for grades one through eight reading intervention, we also look at iReady reading. Again, this is a shift for us from looking at, are they making any growth at all to are they meeting that really aspirational stretch target growth um, goal that was set for them. And so, um, I, the other thing to consider is all of these students in intervention, this encompasses students in a comprehension intervention, as well as those receiving foundational skills intervention, the students in structured literacy. Um, so sometimes it takes us some time to see growth in iReady on comprehension because the students are still working at that foundational level. So we have some other drill-in measures like the oral reading fluency and the uh, quick phonics screener that we give three times a year to students in, in intervention, um, in structured literacy interventions, just so that we can make sure, okay, they're making progress on these, they have the basic skills in place, um, they're just having a little trouble with automaticity and automaticity and they need increased practice so that they're able to be fluent enough for us to see the gains in comprehension. And then um, for ninth and 10th grade, again, we're, we're seeing, we see a consistent level of growth, but it's not as high as the growth that we see in elementary and middle school. Um, we're continuing to explore professional learning opportunities and coaching opportunities um, for our literacy specialists, our interventionists at high school, um, to help them know when to make adjustments as needed for these students. But we also see this as evidence that we need to continue to recommend earlier intervention and earlier support pathways, um, just because we know that research tells us students make less growth in reading as they get older. So we are going to continue to, to double our efforts, you know, in, in providing early um, intervention. Any questions? I'll, I'll go okay. ahead. I was going to say, it, it doesn't matter to me who starts. I think, um, Mr. J, you, you started to get going. Yeah, I was just going to, uh, I, I thought you were calling, calling us, so I, I didn't hear that happen, so that's why I popped okay. on. But okay. um, I just want to uh, thank you for your presentation, um, and thank you for the last thing you said about the um, doubling down on reading. I had a question about that. Uh, it is very pivotal. If students can't read, they, they, you know, the entire learning process gets shut down. And so that's really um, good. I'm very encouraging to hear that you're doubling down on reading. My, I had a question um, pointed towards that. So since you, you made that comment, I'll ask other questions. I um, wanted to um, ask about the percentage of students in CPS. You may not have this right now, uh, maybe just for even last year. Uh, the percentage of students we had in tiers one, two, and three. Um, so I'm curious about that. 
you may not have that on you right now, but that's, I'm just curious about the percentage of students we have who are in, in these tiers. Um, yeah, absolutely, Mr. J, I can get that data for you, so we'll 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 send it to you. Sure. Yep. And then um, let's see. So this, is, this question is kind of kind of kind of hard, but I'll try to try to frame it the best I can. When looking at you mentioned before doubling down on reading, which is so important. Um, at what point in time would a student um, with their, their, their dibbles or their reading score and just their reading proficiency, um, at what point would it disqualify them from being uh, bound for a diploma? At what point does that happen? Well, okay. You, you know, I mean, there is no single data point that necessarily disqualifies a student for a diploma. Um, when when a special education team meets, it's an entire team and they're looking at a variety of data points. So we would, the team would never just take dibbles and say, well, you're not at this benchmark, so you're no longer eligible for a diploma. It's, uh, I, I think it's a bit more nuanced than that, the conversations that occur in, in an IEP team meeting about, well, about, about graduation specifically. Yeah, it's kind of in both veins. I want to make sure, like, you know, uh, I'm asking, if, and I also want to make sure we're, we're not, how are we making sure when, we, when kids graduate from, from SEPS, they are readers and we aren't um, rubber stamping students because it's important that we, you know, if we need to tell a student you need more assessment, um, we don't feel that you are, um, you know, career, college or career ready. Is there a point where we, we self-assess and go, you know what, we really want you to have this, you know, after, you know, higher higher you know 21 year old 18 year old you know program to where you're not we don't want to we want to make sure the quality of our diplomas mean something that we don't have students who are graduating and are not you know well i don't want to ever hear that scp has failed me like how how we make sure that that, that doesn't happen yeah, and and so you know you mentioned a twenty one year old, and and certainly there are there are students, um, special education students who who may attend through twenty one, and they they would they would earn a certificate, but not necessarily a diploma. Okay. So, so there is a way to sort of differentiate between, um, you know, and of course the program is specifically designed to meet the needs of students who who aren't working at grade level, who maybe have some some you know some some learning issues some cognitive issues that mm -hmm. that preclude them from being able to access grade level curriculum but we we typically wait to make those decisions until you know you're more often than not until you know eighth and ninth grade um occasionally it's clear you know if, if a student has an intellectual disability perhaps a decision is made sooner but but more often than not those decisions are made you know end of end of middle school and beginning of high school and and that's fine. Thank you for sharing that on Dr. Vetter. I just want to make sure that we we um and we're clear with students and like you know like you know this is where you are academically and so it, it raises the level of quality of, of our program if we're frank with students and we we're supporting them. We double down on reading. Uh, as Kelly mentioned earlier, we're doubling double down on reading and supporting them. But if we get to a point where that it's not the case and they're not. And we're honest with them. We let them know what their options are. We support them the best we can, but we're not just rubber stamping students. So if we have a point where we make that clear to them, then we, we're doing our job. Um, so I just want to thank you all for that. Speaking, speaking of that doubling down on reading, that's so important. Just wanted to really put that out there. Um, this one last question. We get a lot of uh, questions about the science of reading. I know you guys are very, very um, versed in that. Could you just for the sake of the public um, speak about that just, just, for, just for a moment? Sure. So we've been doing a lot of work in recent years, um, not just our team, the curriculum team um, across all departments centrally. We've been um, focusing a lot of our, our professional learning around that. So there's the opportunity for our teachers to take letters, uh, which is a course that um, it's, it's very intensive and it helps our teachers understand the importance of uh, aligning instruction to the science of reading. We have a similar course for administrators from letters. We have an early childhood version of letters. Um, we also have uh, for maybe those stakeholders who are um, perhaps uh, not 
designing the instruction directly themselves, but they're supporting it. We have some um, some professional learning options that might be one day or two day trainings um, that they can participate in to learn about. And then I think more than that is is just making sure that all of our messaging and all of other, our other professional learning opportunities um, is aligned to the science of reading so that they're hearing it organically um, throughout their day. We've done work with our literacy specialists, with our intervention teachers, um, through our high quality instructional materials that are rolling out in elementary school. We've been able to embed that learning through those professional learning opportunities. So I think it's just helping um, people understand, you know, this is this is the brain science. This is the way that we research has shown us that uh, students learn to read. Um, and what does that mean for a student given their individual profile? So if we have a multi-lingual uh, learner who is, um, you know, a, a few years into, into our country and at certain language levels on their access testing, what does that mean about what supports they need for literacy? And so just really making a, a personalized approach for each case so that we can find the best supports for each child. Does that help answer your question a little bit? Absolutely. And the questions I asked you, I know some of them were, 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 were stressful and like high pressure, but that's, 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 that's for a point, point, of, point of clarity. Um, gold is tested when it's in the fire. So the questions I asked you, when the public hears that, they know, okay, are, are we being clear with our students? Or do we have a point where, where we know someone is diploma, some, some bound for diploma? Do we have that, that the differentiation? Are we doubling down on reading? Do we have signs of reading in check? And you have all that. So the questions that I asked you are also so the public can know what you're up to and how good you're working. Well, thank you very much. Well, thank you. Mr. Bass. Sure, thank you. Um, excellent presentation. I think we say that after almost every presentation. Um, I, I think I have three questions. Um, with most of the data that you presented, we saw improvement from last year to this year. That's not necessarily the case with all the iReady data. And how how is your team evaluating that? There, there are a couple of things too, and uh, and I know Ms. Denty is going to talk more, but um, we have a, a brand new reading program in in um, in the, the primary grades, and we have a second year reading program in three through five, and and those are those are aligned to the science of reading too, and that's why you know we as a system invest in those high quality instructional materials, and that's important to note. The, the, the learning sequence in, in the primary program right now is different than the one this year, is different than the one we had last year. Now, we believe at the end of the year, we're going to see greater growth, but that one of the reasons why it's hard to compare data from, from you know, this year to last year is we, we have two different programs with a different scope and sequence. And so that's going to sort of impact the data a little bit. Um, but, you know, we um, we as a as a school system back in February we met centrally and conducted a systemic data review of mid year I ready dibbles um, to take a look at um, how how our students were performing and and you know schools do that on a regular basis through the school improvement process well then we use that for systemic process so we take a look and say like where are the needs where maybe we need to do some additional training. We know that we can't just purchase new programs and expect everything to be great, right? There's a, a great deal of teacher training and support that needs to occur along the way. And so these systemic reviews that we conducted um, mid-year was, uh, was in February for ELA, um, we took a look. And then we also think about like what, what additional resources do we need to support these programs? So we do look at this data centrally, and I know schools also look at it um, themselves to kind of see what adjustments they need to make. And the other piece I'll add, uh, Mr. Bass, to what Dr. Vetter said was, again, the data you saw was the middle of the year, not end of year. And so the middle of year, obviously, it's a snapshot in time. Um, kids are moving at different paces as they go through their learning. Um, and looking at the beginning of the year to the end of the year is also, you know, a rather, another really, really important measure. So we always want to point out that, you know, here we are in the middle of the year and we want to show the data in real time. Um, but there's more stories to be told uh, once we get to the end of your data. Yeah, that sounds reasonable. Um, I, I also want to ask about kind of um, budget around multi-tier system of supports. I, I think in the last two budget cycles, we've had to make some cuts to MTSS. I, perhaps it was 
that the expansion to tier three interventions wasn't done quite as quickly as initially proposed, um, I think. So I, I guess my questions are, um, what, what would you like us as board members to really be thinking about as, you know, really essential to, you know, continue in our investment with MTSS? And I don't know, is is our tier four interventions on the table at some point in, in an excellent budget year? So I, I'm going to ask, well, M Mr. Murphy um, has a comment too. So one of the things I want to really make clear is that you saw the, the plethora of intervention programs we have um, for reading. And, and if you looked at the elementary level and specifically, there are programs for, you know, there are programs for second graders who are who are in need of support with first grade skills. There are programs for third graders who are in support of second grade skills. And so one of the challenges that we have is how do school staff all of these individual interventions? These are, you know, evidence um, research-based um, interventions. And so we know that they're the right programs, but training people and making sure that we have enough support to teach all of these interventions in every school can be a challenge. So, so staffing is definitely going to be one of those issues that, that we're, we're constantly dealing with. E either, I, Scott, I know you wanted to say something too, and then Tom. Mr. Murphy, go ahead, and then I'll be happy to follow up. Well, I was just going to point out on one of the slides you saw in the presentation, um, called out the importance of tier one instruction for every single student. Um, and that's where we feel really good about the high quality instructional materials that we as a system have invested in and have the resources that we need um, to not only meet the needs of every single student through uh, tier one instruction, but also as we go through those tiers. As Dr. Vetter said, we, we do feel good about having the resources we need. Um, and we do appreciate the board support and even the state support through the Maryland Leads Initiative that helped us invest in those high quality instructional materials, tier one foundational reading. Um, so kind of the bigger picture of tier one instruction um, before we even speak to intervention really is fundamental. And then uh, Mr. Bass, specifically to your question, um, I think protecting as best you can contingency positions because reading does not happen evenly across the county. We have pockets where we see kids who may struggle. And if we could just in time provide a teacher in second grade, for example, with a group of kids at a particular elementary school that has, for whatever reason, there, but not across the county, that's where the contingency positions are just so critical at the elementary, middle, and high school where we can respond just in time to the situations that may occur that to, to nobody's fault. It's just the reality that we have a group of kids that are in a particular situation that we may be able to help if we have the staffing. I really appreciate that, uh, that specificity. Um, one last quick question uh, in terms of teachers trained in uh, OG+. Plus. How are, how are we doing with that? Uh, is there is the need greater than um, than we can currently meet? So o OG plus um, Orchard Gillingham uh, plus is a is a program that's actually run by the special education department and and we mm -hmm. collaborate with them. So we we don't oversee that training. Um, I, I do know that the that the um, the the training for it is. Um, is is certainly robust, um, but I, I don't know where they stand in terms of the number of people who are trained and, and what needs are right now. We can follow up with you on that, Mr. Bass, um, mm -hmm. in terms of specific numbers, as well as um, we always want to point out the hundreds of teachers who have taken the letters course, which is a, a fundamental course helping teachers with practices aligned to science of reading. So we can follow, follow up with you on those specific numbers of teachers. Excellent. Thank you. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll wind up here with the questions. Um, I had some uh, similar questions to my colleagues, which you've already answered. And I wanna thank everybody for uh, your presentation and, and the work that we're doing for our students. Um, I, I, I just would like to uh, go back to slides um, 10 and 11. I'm gonna, we talked a lot about the reading and I'm gonna kind of go back to math. 
here on this. And um, I think when we're when we're fla flashing data, because I know we're going to get KPIs on what, how we're doing overall, because like I think right now this on slide 10, we're looking at tier two and tier three um, uh, intervention data sets here. Um, and uh, I'm wondering, you know, when you look at, I'm, I'm looking at slide 10 on the iReady math, looking at the 22, 23 mid-year uh, stretch target to the 23, 24 stretch target. And we've seen the number percent met gone down. I'm wondering, do we have the same percentage of students receiving tiered support? It, like I have so many questions of just about how that data is presented that I almost think maybe we should look at how we would frame that going forward to, because I just have a ton of questions just about that one slide. Um, and, and so uh, like, what, what's your take? Like, why did you decide that that was important to show to us? So we, we also had similar conversations. One, one of the tricky parts of this is every student receiving a tier two or tier three intervention is also receiving that high quality tier one instruction. And that we know that that's changed over the last couple of years, especially for elementary school. They have a brand new um, iReady program that is um, more mastery based. And so um, because it's not cyclical in nature, it may take a longer time for students to build a foundation um, before they're really ready to take off. So I think that second half of the year data that we can't yet show you is mm -hmm. very important for us to see, you know, what, what does it look like at the end of the year? Um, how, how much growth did we kind of make up some of what we saw as maybe a loss in the, in the first half of the year compared to last year? The other piece of this that we're, we're working on um, is again, helping our schools not just focus on typical growth, what the growth is that they would be expected to make in a year, but rather for students who are working significantly below grade level to make more than a year's worth of growth in a year. And so I think that that shift in our schools is, is taking some time that we need to not just focus on growth, but focus on enough growth and, and better than enough growth. Um, one of the ways that we're hoping to target this is to look at our school improvement process. Um, previously, we had allowed schools to progress monitor their school improvement process with typical growth targets, um, but we feel like we kind of need to up the ante a little bit and to uh, focus them in on stretch growth because that's really where we're going to be able to see the gains. So I think that's one area that we're looking at. The other thing is we talked a lot about reading, and yes, I want to double down on reading, but um, multi-sensory math supports and, and, and really intensive math supports for early numeracy issues are so important and helping students that have those needs has been an area of focus. We had a wonderful training similar to our science of reading and structured literacy trainings that we've done. Um, we had uh, the math equivalent um, come in and do some work with our math specialists and intervention teachers and we're, we're going to continue that training next year. But that multi-sensory math training is so important for not just um, helping our teachers know how far below grade level are students and what skills do they need to work on but specifically what strategies and intensive instruction is going to get them back to grade level. So that's a relatively um, newer concept and one that we're exploring more. Um, and to the budget question, I did also want to share our gratitude for the, um, the monies that we receive for dyscalculia and um, dysgraphia and dyslexia. That has gone to great use. And in previous years, we used a lot of that for our structured literacy. This year, we were able to use that um, that money to go towards that multi-sensory math support as well, in addition to our reading supports. So I think you know the, that was kind of the sense we were making of the data right now. But again, it's mid-year data. So we'll be doing a more in-depth analysis at the end of the year to just make sure we're on the right track with those things. Okay, and so I'll, and taking that into account, then um, I, I'll I, I just as a parent um, who, of a student who is working with both iReady and Alex, I, as a parent and someone on the board of education, I, I know we're using both. And how many systems do we know that are using both simultaneously? So we're actually, we're in the process right now of drafting our local assessment uh, plan for next year. And one of the things we're taking a look at is, um, you know, where we may be duplicating um, the assessments that we're using. And so we're taking a look at use of iReady at the middle school level as an assessment tool anyway, 
um, for, for all students as sort of a universal screener in math. Um, because we do have Alex and Alex is, um, is wedded to the, um, to the curriculum that we have with Reveal mm -hmm. Math. Um, one of the challenges was that Alex and I already were providing different data. Alex was providing really great data for classroom teachers to respond to student needs. And it was providing um, support for students. I already was providing good information about how schools and the district as a whole was doing. But as we're beginning to understand Alex a little bit better, we're realizing that we think we may be able to get data for different levels of use with just from Alex. And if we can confirm that, and we confirm that there's a correlation between success in Alex and Alex um, and success on MCAP, well then maybe we don't need iReady um, as an assessment tool for math at the middle school level anymore. So we're constantly looking at, at those situations and evaluating them to make sure that we're not over-testing kids, but we're also getting the data we need to make uh, informed decisions. Okay, I appreciate that and answer. I'll also add, Ms. Johnson, you're, you're spot on. Um, Remember, we also have what's known as the District Committee on Assessment that brings together central office, teachers. We have parents that serve on that committee. It meets every other year. Um, and um, that question that you just raised is probably one of the number one themes that has surfaced about middle school is, is there some duplication on what we're getting out of iReady and Alex, and where can we cut it back? Keep in mind that this is only the second year of kind of full-scale use of both of them, and so we're learning, and I think it's it's a good example of how we can continue to iterate the assessment strategy. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. And um, and I, I know we're, I want to move to the next topic because I'm determined we'll finish during our meeting time today, but I can't let my last question go without um, uh, asking. And that it is rolling back to the reading. And one of the things that's always percolating in the back of my head is our graduation rate for our Latino students. Um, and my desire as a board member to help ensure we're doing everything we can to elevate that rate. Um, and so when we're talking about the reading, I'm wondering like what specific assessment and, and data slices are we looking at uh, to help? Because you, you can't, what, the read to learn, you have to learn to read before you can what read to learn and i'm wondering is there any correlation between that and and so i would like to just have feedback from you all as to what we're doing uh in thought around particularly graduation rates for our latino students and is there anything having to do with reading and language that we could uh improve on to help increase those rates if yeah. that is a factor yeah i can share a little bit about what we're doing so i know you asked specifically about graduation but um, you know, in, in terms of going way back to the beginning for our, our primary grades, we've mm -hmm. also purchased an assessment called Lectura, which allows us to measure the same skills that we measure in Dibbles in the English language in Spanish language. Okay. And so um, what that does is it helps us in our um, one way bilingual immersion program um, to measure students who are receiving some instruction in Spanish and how they're progressing. But more to your point, it allows us to determine whether a need is um, language acquisition based mm -hmm. and a student maybe needs more supports in learning the English language, or perhaps is it a foundational deficit that we um, that they would have in their um, first language anyway. And so that assessment has been really valuable for us to kind of determine um, how do we build the supports that are appropriate for that child? Do they need structured literacy or do they need something more in the way of, of their language acquisition supports that they're getting? Um, now, for older learners, the other important thing to draw attention to is that the science of reading is not just decoding and word recognition. The science of reading, if you look at Scarborough's Rope, also addresses language comprehension. And that can be a struggle for many of our students um, whose um, first language is not English. And so um, I know our teacher specialist uh, for reading intervention, Brittany Garst, who's on the call, um, has done some professional learning this year, um, primarily with our, our secondary teachers on strategies for building background and vocabulary. I know our curriculum team, um, Liz Matheny, our curriculum specialist for uh, English language arts at the secondary level, has done a lot of professional learning with literacy specialists and teachers about those important um, uh, parts of, of 
learning to read and reading to learn um, that that would come into play for students who um, just may need extra um, building in terms of um, their their um, their comprehension skills, um, looking at um, maybe, you know, their writing, their their thought processes about what they're reading. And so that's a really critical part, especially for our older learners who have the decoding skills, but there's still a gap there. Um, so that's an area that we continue to explore and build out professional learning around. Okay, thank you. And multilingual education program is an agenda item next month. Um, and so we'll make sure that you know, some of those questions that you queued up are also part of that presentation. Thank you, Mr. Murphy. All right. Um, I don't know if Scott, you're gonna take over to the next uh, item on media updates. If you are ready for us to transition, thank you team. And um, next up uh, we have Mary Jo Richmond, our supervisor of media services, who is going to share with you uh, media updates if Ms. Richmond is ready to go. Good morning, I'm very ready to go. Okay. Um, it's great to be here today to present um, my media update to the Curriculum and Instruction Committee. I'd like to start with a broad overview of some of the big work that our school librarians do. I tell you that the focus of their work day in and day out is about strong, strong curriculum and literature connections. Of course, all of that is centered around relationships that they have with the students, staff, and administrators in their buildings as they each continue to build the best school library program that they can. And the programs in each of our buildings are different, focusing on the strengths of the school librarian and on the strengths of others in that building too. It's a collaborative effort in each school as our libraries are truly the hub of learning in many of our schools. We've begun to embed computational thinking standards in everyday lessons, and I'll explain more about that in our next slide, but it's been a game changer for us. One of our core jobs is to help build the reading capacity of the students in our building to support the core reading instruction that our English language arts and content area teachers do every day. So I'm so glad that Kelly Denty talked about that because it's part of what we do all the time too. It's why you see the media specialist champion reading so much. We know that increased pleasure reading helps increase vocabulary knowledge for the core content reading that our students experience. Whoops, wrong screen. Several years ago, we began to add computational thinking to many of our elementary lessons. This enabled all students to experience simple, simple I'm sorry, to experience simple computer science skills and terminology starting at a young age, but through the lens of media. For instance, students as young as kindergarten learn about algorithms when they are asked to develop a set of steps or instructions to design a path to lead the pigs back to the pen that they escaped from at the Great Frederick Fair. Students who have experienced these enhanced lessons are now entering middle schools where computational thinking is infused throughout the curriculum. We have seen how the computer science pathways have grown exponentially in our system and that will continue to do so, enabling our students many choices in college and career. Our summer curriculum writing workshops continue to support this work. Media services helps to facilitate the purchase of digital tools or databases that are used throughout the system. Two that are used in many of our schools are Pebble Go and Britannica. Pebble Go and Pebble Go Next are primarily used in our elementary schools, but many of our secondary schools have purchased the Pebble Go program for their specialized programs. It's affordable and it's just very easy to use. As you can see, it's been used over 2 million times since we first purchased it. We've had this program since the 13-14 school year, so this is our 11th year utilizing it. Our teachers rely on this program. The company continues to stay relevant and shortly, at, shortly after the NCAA finals this past weekend, an article on Caitlin Clark was published. Britannica was another program purchased in 2013. 
Since that time, our larger school community has performed 22 million searches within this program. To break that down a bit, that means that last school year, we had 270,000 searches in this program. So when a user logs in to search for something, for instance, they might have been searching for Caitlin Clark. Once they see the choices they have, they could have digressed and then gone on to look at images, videos, alternative basketball players that showed up. If they had started at the middle school level, they could have chosen an article with a one, a two, or a three, which just means it's a leveled article, and they could have gone up to element, I mean, gone up to high school or gone down to an elementary article. Every movement within this program adds up to another search, which all adds up over these 13 years to give us a 22 million count. So you can see that both PebbleGo and Britannica are programs that our teachers, our greater community, relies on for quality resources. The circulation system that we use in our county, um, we all call TLC. It stands for the Library Corporation. Our many of our schools have implemented what we call self-checkout, but all of our elementary schools have really implemented self-checkout. It gives our students agency because they really feel proud of themselves when they can do it themselves. It enables our substitutes to have easy access to our circulation system too. And when students are confident users of the systems, it allows our media specialists to step away from the circulation desks and to move to the shelves to help the students with book selection. I really appreciate, too, that this is the same software that our public library colleagues are using. And we've been working through in preparation for next year, we've been working through a couple of limited pilots in the CII department to ensure that a program called the Prohibited List can be up and running for the next school year. This program will enable parents and guardians to create lists of books that would be prohibited in their families um, to check out. Um, they'll be able to log into the public access catalog at their child's school and to create these lists. If their child tries to check that book out, our circulation system wouldn't allow that book to scan out successfully. We will have more information about this on fcps.org when the program is ready to roll out. Any questions? Okay, we'll start with Mr. Bass this time around. Great, thank you. Um, I really appreciated um, your starting this discussion around um, increasing student interest and enjoyment in reading. Um, I I have a question that yeah it it could be it could be challenging, but I'm certainly thinking about it. I as a board member, I have some concerns that some of the uh potential uh restrictions on what an individual student can check out could affect uh interest and enjoyment in reading and i just wonder if that's been a thought or discussion at all and um yeah how, how you're thinking about that you mean with the prohibited list feature coming yeah. into play yeah there's a, a district in texas that has implemented this already and um, only eight families took advantage of it. So I don't know that um, we're going to have a lot of families that do this. So we'll we'll see. It's it's the onus is going to be on the families to do it. Um, there's going to be no interaction with um, school staff to do it. School staff cannot do this for families. It's totally on the families. Yeah, no, I, I know that. And um, yeah, I think um, from my perspective, uh, you and your teams are, are doing the best you can in what I would call um, a difficult situation. Yep. Um, thank you. And to your point, Mr. Bass, and to what Ms. Richmond said, um, this is going to be new for our community. And so we will we will learn a lot as we implement it next year. As you know, it um, was an outgrowth of decisions made uh, related to the reconsideration report that was released earlier in the year. And um, this will be our first, you know, our, our first 
attempt with using a prohibited list, but we will learn a lot. Uh, the other thing I wanted to point out was that um, the policy committee is going to be doing a first read of a uh, policy related to library materials coming in May. Uh, so there is some parallel work happening right now with policy that I wanted to draw your attention to. Thank you. I probably should have put that in the in this, but I didn't. But I think everybody's aware that that's happening. Yep. And by the way, I didn't put this in the report too. Our circulation statistics of books being checked out have remained steady over probably the past ten years. I'm very. I won't be around to see it because I'm retiring at the end of this year. But I'm very curious to see what the effect of the science of reading does to increase reading capacity in our students, how that affects our circulation statistics over time. So um, I think it's going to increase. I think our children will check out more books over time from our school libraries. It'll be nice to see. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. J. Thank you. Um, just wanted to um, th thank you for your um, work with your team and um, just want to highlight um, librarians and media specialists for being like, honestly, a heartbeat um, for uh, schools for kids. I know for thank me, you. Um, my pleasure. And I know for me and what I, and what I've, from and my experience and what I've seen with students um, and you as, a, as an educator, um, it sometimes, in a lot of, a lot of cases, the person who's a librarian or media specialist is it becomes that student or teacher's best friend. And so um, because they're so pivotal and so awesome, I'm wondering, is there any, um, has there been any thought or looking at for like um, saying like cross training for like counseling for um, librarians? Because they the kids come to know about books and also about the concerns sometimes. And like, you know, I know they can refer, but also are there any like overarching training they, 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 they they've received or? That's that's an interesting idea. We often joke about the doctor is in because kids do come and, and share their hearts with the media specialists, but they do a good job of um, encouraging the kids to go and talk to the guidance counselors. Um, yeah. Yeah, just kind of put it out there for like I thought maybe like a, a line, you know, just as long as that, that line is working between the, um, the counselor and the um, librarian, it, it can work out great. Um, okay. I wanted to thank you for your uh, mention of, of computer science. And I know this is still developing in policy and we're looking at this right now, but I, I wanted to um, put it on, on the raft. There's kind of a feel out there that, that soon when we look at um, specialists and, and librarians for you know training our students in AI. I know right now um, everybody's kind of has a, a pushback mindset towards AI, but there is some integration that needs to happen. Uh, if you look at College Board right now, I, I teach AP classes and in College Board, there's there is a um, allowance of AI. Students have to um, you know document and, and and report their use uses of the material in their programs. But there is a, there is an allowance for it in College Board. Now there are um, ways to um, verify student growth and learning because like even with College Board they're doing like you know authentic assessment where kids are have to produce on site test day of certain material. But their uses of, of, of AI is kind of like you know it's being engrafted. So sort of put that out there like you know for the uh, specialists to consider soon they'll be teaching kids about tools uh, in that in that regard as well. I, I can see that coming in, in, in policy as well. Um, then I wanted to, um, I actually had a different look at how um, the checklist comes up for parents. Um, I, I, I'm glad to see that we're allowing parent choice um, in the schools. The only thing I, I still haven't seen, one thing I have to see is um, we have to get parents back in high schools for parent um uh, counseling sessions, but I think when parents have choice in, in a school system and they feel they're they're engaged in, in the process of raising their child, um, I think it 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 goes a long way. And you mentioned before it wasn't even used that much in Texas, but what happens is the option is there, and parents need options. So I think that's a real good thing to have there um, because you know maybe you never know what the situation can be used. Everybody looks at it as a negative connotation, but there's just some positives there um, very much so as well. So I'm glad we have parent options. Um, and then, um, science of reading, you mentioned that, and I'm actually also curious about to see how our students, um, growth happens in their, 
uh, checkout, a library checkout versus the, um, the growth in their reading gains. And there's a very cool one to uh, commend SCPS on using tools that are used in public libraries. That's the great, we have that same system going on. And one to ask that we kind of look, look, at, look at that going forward, like even how we do our, um, you know, I know colleges use Canvas for their, for their grading. I know we don't have that right now, but SchoolG is something I'm not seeing used on a college level, but Canvas is. So just putting it out there for our, our you know, looking forward how you use technology, we should be looking to match our technology with what kids are using in the next level. Because when they leave school and go to the library, they'll know, oh, same thing I had at school. That's great. We're teaching them the right way. And when we have our technology that kids use and how they get their grades, how they get their, get their reading material, get their ed education, it should match with, with, with what the next, next level is going to be. So that's a great theme to keep going. Thanks so much. Thank you. Okay, I'll jump in uh, next then. And um, I guess, Ms. Richmond, this, this will be your last media uh, updates presentation. And so I want to, uh, in advance, thank you for your decades of uh, devoted service to uh, Frederick County Public Schools and our, our students and families. Um, I, so it's nice going last because uh, Mr. Bass and Mr. J touched on subjects that are of interest to me too. So as our elected members of the public, uh, you, you know, to, to, to represent them, um, I, I see the point that Mr. Bass was making about, well, if we put a system in uh, to um, uh, control access, students may have to some of our library material, uh, it, what it, what could the potential negative impacts that could be? And then, as you all have said, um, that we, we won't know unless we try. And I think providing, uh, being just completely open and forthright with what our materials are is important. And then giving uh, parents choices and families choices uh, to make decisions for for them and 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 their children um, and our students, I think is important. So I'm glad that we're taking those measures and I hope that we're, we have a really good rollout plan for communicating that. I think that that's going to be super important. Um, I also, uh, rolling back to what Mr. J had said, um, now that I'm back in the classroom uh, at FCC, I'm actually teaching segments on chat GPT to use that as a learning tool to do projects uh, in my classes. And so, um, so I think, I think the more that we can incorporate uh, the, the beneficial uses of uh, artificial intelligence, um, the, I think, you know, the, the further we can get ahead of that, the better. I don't think we can just see it as, oh, this is like something we need to be mindful of. It will help students cheat. I think using, using your tools uh, to, to benefit your learning is important. So I, I don't know what we're doing in that regard, but I mean, it's here, it's now, and I hope we have good policies developed around it. Um, I mean, it was just amazing. Uh, Mr. J, my students were creating UML diagrams from code, something I would expect them to go have to learn on their own, but you can just plug the code in and it generates it for you and it tells you how it did it. And it just like produces a whole learning example. That's awesome. <laughs> and, yeah. Yeah. But basically something that would normally take them about two hours to do learn on their own, they can do in about five minutes now. Right. So, um, and so I think we need to kind of embrace that and figure out how is it going to help improve the learning of our students and then, um, the, again, with the whole, I, I look at it because, you know, my background is from FCC and, and, and we focus a lot of energy on information literacy. So I know we have our resources there, but I think it's so important to make sure that students know what are valid resources. And I think going forward, that's even going to be more important is, is, is knowing uh, how to use valid resources. Um, and, and so I don't know what efforts we're making in that regard. I know Pebble Go, I've used that with, with my own son and then uh, in, in Encyclopedia Britannica has been there forever. But I just want to know, like, what efforts are we making to help students become informed learners of their own resources that they're providing to each other? Um, so I just, I think that that's just, something I'd like to have a statement on is what are we doing with respect to AI and what are we doing with respect to, I'm going to call it information literacy for validating resources. And, and I, I'd say we would call it media literacy. And there's a lot of work being done in our secondary schools, especially about media literacy and digital citizenship to um, ensure that kids are um, learning the difference between um, valid resources and fake, fake resources. Um, they use noodle tools across, we use noodle tools across the district for students to cite resources. 
Um, and we teach kids, especially our juniors and seniors, that um, they're on their own when they get to a college because colleges don't provide uh, a citation builder for them so that they have to um, learn to use one um, and then make a decision when they get to college about what they're going to use. Um, and then we use a lot of information from um, Common Sense Media, um, which provide free resources to the nation um, on, on digital citizenship. And they have great lessons for us to use. We tend to download them and then tweak them because they tend to be um, a little bit easy. So we tend to make them a little bit harder before we implement them to our students. Um, so, um, but they're a great, great place to start. I don't know if you've ever looked at Common Sense Media, but if you look up media literacy in there, they're just fantastic resources on, on media literacy. Okay. And th those were my questions uh, in, 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 in some, so. Oh, what I, I know with rolling out, are we purchasing a system? Uh, did you? I don't think you it, like mentioned a name for uh, putting like a hold on materials to 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 keep them from being checked out by students. It's um just part of the program we already use. It's okay. at, when the system gets upgraded every quarter. I I don't know. Up, they add new features or refine the features that exist, and this was part of an upgrade that came out for first quarter this year. It's, um, we're piloting it now, but we can't roll it out yet because um, the logins are just um, restricted right now to ADFS, which is what we have in-house. And at some point, probably third quarter this year, we'll be able to let outsiders log into the system. We don't know yet when that's gonna actually happen. But right now to let outsiders log in, we'd have to buy an ADFS login for them and we can't afford it. Okay. Oh. Okay. Yeah, that, well, would, be, that would be one for every parent and or guardian. And it's just, when you take 50, you know, our number of 50,000 students times, you know, two guardians, it's just crazy. Mm -hmm. And the cost of the license, I don't even know what they cost, but more than we can afford. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I, I, yes, I look forward I to hearing more about that. Ms. Richmond, just so um, the public also understands the essence of what we want to be able to do with a prohibited list um, is part of our existing uh, software that's used in our libraries. Exactly. Right. No, no new software is involved at all. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And no additional cost to us. It's just mm -hmm. part of the um, next update that's going to roll out. I, I don't want to ask too many questions in advance of actually seeing it, but just the, you know, I, I, people forward me materials and then I go in and I look at the catalog and then I had trouble finding a couple of titles myself. And I just think, and, and, and I'm wondering like, is it going to be easy that you can check a box on, you know, these categories of titles and how would we determine what categories of titles would, would make it in? Or do you have to go title specific? Cause how would somebody be able then to, like, how do you know what you might not know? And, and so it, it, I, I don't want to be premature, but. It's pretty easy to do. For instance, if you didn't want your child to check out the game, the book Hunger Games, you would just go in and click on the book Hunger Games and create a list of prohibited titles. Okay. And then, and then you would add five more titles to that prohibited list. But that's like a, a, a title itself. What if you didn't know a, a specific title? You, you You have to know the titles. Well, that's again. That's where I potentially like would have a concern. Um, I'm just looking here. Uh, I don't know. Let's say you know, I'm pulling out uh, one of. I, I have most of the books that were brought up by the reconsideration committee to read, and so behind me I have a, a whole section of them. But how do, how would I know? Like for example, let let's talk about it. The Teen's Guide to Sex Relationships and Being a Human. And let's say we have a a very um, you know, con the uh, religious, uh, faith-based family who might not want to have their child have access to a title like this, but not knowing that it's called Let's Talk About It. Like, is there going to be a subject matter? They could certainly search for a word like sex and see what comes up from that search mm -hmm. and then click all books that show up from that subject-based search. Okay. 
So I just, I hope you know what I'm getting at is I like, do. You, I do. you want to be helpful to yeah. families, you know, cause maybe they only have eight families using it in Texas cause it's not easy to use. Yep. You and know? I think as was stated, this is an example of something that's still in development and so you see it and use it. I think you're right, Ms. Johnson, you know, so I think this will be a good um, thing for us to continue to update the committee about as the developments finish, the pilots finish, and we roll it out system wide. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So thank you again. I know these are not; they might say, sound like awkward conversations, but I want to be forward and front facing out there, and and just making sure you know we're doing the best we can for serving all of our families and 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 what uh, you know things that are important to them. And I know you know it, we have a balance there. You know, you, you so it's a, it's a it's a tricky navigation. But I think if we give families tools to help them. Um, I, I don't see anything wrong with that. And I don't see anything. I think people need to realize, you know, we're going to potentially make mistakes in our rollout, but that's the thing is, is you're going to learn from them and then like keep refining. So, so I'm glad just that we're going to try to incorporate this and, uh, and I look forward to just having like a clear way to, you know, give parents choices. Um, so, cause they are, that's what they are as parents. So, right. um, thank you. All right. Else. We go move on to the next one, Mr. Murphy. Yeah, and thank you, Ms. Johnson, for your recognition of Mary Jo Richmond and her retirement. Um, our staff joins the board in congratulating her and thanking her for her many, many years of service to our system. Thanks, Mary Jo. You're welcome. Thank you all. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, final topic. And this is one, uh, before I turn it over, that I just want to mention that having um, – come from another district in recent years, the virtual programming in Frederick County has been one that I've studied for a decade um, because um, our team here in FCPS has always been a leader in this area as it relates to virtual learning, pre-pandemic, during pandemic, and now thinking about our vision for the future. So just wanted to again acknowledge the team, the great work that's been done over the years with all things virtual learning. Um, and so I'll turn it over to Tom Saunders and the team to get us going. So good morning again. Great to be with you all. And I'm going to try to present here. So we're going to try my Google skills. You get introduced as the virtual um, folks. And then if you can't start to virtually show something, doesn't show a whole lot of confidence. Um, so hold on a second here. Um, so before we get started thank you scott so much for the um accolades and really the accolades go to the next two presenters after me um, i would like to highlight mike watson as somebody who is not only a fcps leader but someone who's a leader in the state and the nation um, i would also like to congratulate christine samuels dr samuels is ending her coming to the end of her first year as a principal in frederick county we are so excited that she's here with us and has done a great job she has taken over for Dr. Vetter, who is, you know, in a different role. So we're very excited with this team and very appreciative of their talents. So I get the privilege of sharing an overview of the program. Can everybody see the slides that I'm presenting? Yes, Tom, it's working just fine. Excellent. All right. So just to bring everybody up to speed, this is the third year of the remote virtual program. And if you recall, Last year, there was an elementary and a middle school program, as well as a high school program that was remote virtual. And that's different than the virtual school that is dedicated to high school um, that has been around, which Dr. Uh, Mr. Murphy was talking about, that's been around for about a decade. So last year, based on enrollment, we reduced the elementary program and we combined it with the middle school program. And this year it was a program that was grades three through eight and high school. And just to bring everybody up to speed, the RVP program at both the elementary, middle and high school follows the same calendar, 180 day FCPS academic calendar. Kids attend live classes daily, Monday through Friday and utilize the FCPS curriculum just through a virtual synchronous setting. Um, students remain enrolled in their home school. So that's why it's called a program and not a school because the kids are remaining, if they're from Walkersville Middle, they're still a Walkersville Middle School student 
Um, they're just um, attending classes um, at the RVP from home. And then the other thing is because they're still enrolled at their school, they still have access to most, if not all, extracurricular activities um, that are happening at their home school. So that is the big overview. Then I want to share the numbers with you, and, and this is um, quite telling. Um, so at the end of the pandemic, we had um, 136 elementary school students. For next year, we're projecting 46. And then for the middle school program, we had 170 at the end of the pandemic, and we're expecting 140, so pretty stable. And then the high school, 318 to 220. So once again, we're seeing a demand more at the middle school and high school level than at the elementary school level. So that is the background for the presentation this morning. And really, I'd like to turn this over to the experts. And so the first person up who's going to be talking about the elementary middle combined program is Dr. Samuels. And I will now yield to you. And let me, will you just tell me when to click the slides, Christine? Yes, I will. Thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. Um, I would just like to add when Tom presented the numbers to what we have into the program, the, that's our total number of students. But I also just want you to realize that the students that we serve is we serve a vast uh, variety of students. And just so you know, we have 32 middle school students that have IEPs and we have 30 uh, middle schools that have 504s just to put into context of the students that we serve in the program. And in the elementary part, we have six, you know, elementary students that have IEPs and four that have uh, five or fours. And now you can go to the next slide, Tom, and just talk about our celebrations that we have. And and with the celebrations with, within the program, I will talk more at the end when you see the number of RVP activities that we do have with our students. And we do have more face-to-face -face activities. The students are having opportunity um, who are dealing with health issues that I mentioned before, like students have IEPs, that they really can continue their learning versus actually being out or going out on HHT and where that service is limited to them and they don't get the number of hours. And we also would like to celebrate the fact that we do offer like French one and French two for our, um, for our middle school students that um, may not have a French teacher in the regular school and school building. Next time. And just some enhancements that we have um, that we have done this year, along with the staff who were here you know, previously, we kind of went together and they pretty much we were looking through some things that could be changed. And one of them was like the application process. And uh, what we mean by that, I know what I, um, with Mike for next year, we have two separate applications instead of just having one where before all the students was, was funneling into one application process. And then we would have to go through and decipher if they were actual high school or middle school. So that's a good thing we're doing like the next year. We've, we've already done that process based on the number of students who have signed up for our program for next year. And just the enhancement combining the elementary and middle school, which is great because when we look at that, especially that fifth grade or sixth grade, when we look at the elementary uh, students not program, the fifth graders who are already in the program really may not have a big gap to like seeing different teachers because they are now enrolled in our program. They're used to seeing those teachers here. And so when they move from fifth grade to sixth grade, it's like, oh, I've already been in the program. I pretty much know how things uh, work, which is an advantage for, uh, for those particular students. But then on the other side of that, we have our challenges where the enrollment in the elementary level, as you have seen previously, that it continues to decline. It does. And, and also with the scheduling. And what I mean about the scheduling uh, being a challenge, sometimes when our students come from uh, the brick and mortar building, uh, like the in-person, they may have been taking um, a pre-engineering class. Well, in the remote virtual program, we have to offer something else for them because we do not have a pre-engineering cl pre class for them. So that's what I mean when I talk about the scheduling piece of it. Um, next, but just to give you some, next time, just to give you some um, just some comments, just from having IEP meetings, 504s, or talking to parents, or even when I'm having my principal chats that I can, that I do once a quarter, um, the one parent just really wanted to share that um, about her student that had made such progress in the program, and they do not know what they would do without this opportunity. And it was it was great to watch their son 
parents make progress. And this particular parent was a middle school student parent and a student who had an IEP. And the other two comments can also came um, from parents that think we're all creating an environment where kids can thrive and reach their true potential. And where the students are receiving extra opportunities for re remediation and enrichment. And we have a power block that, has, that we have set up in the class. And we also put one at the end of elementary as well. So it does allow uh, the opportunity for students um, if they didn't understand something, you know, in one of their classes, the teacher can pull them either for to help them with that work or to enrich those skills during that time frame. And also during that time frame, t um, students have IEP, who have IEPs, our case managers are able to uh, pull those students to actually work on some of those goal setting skills that they may have. Okay, next. And this is just some of the activities that we do within the um, the remote virtual program. And I just I want to highlight it in a sense because of the fact that we know a lot of our students still need that the social skills. They still need to be able to interact. And we try to provide them an environment whereas although they're not in the building, they can still engage in some of the activities that they would if they were in person. And we um, the one I have to highlight is the in person fun fest. They did it. Um, in the previous year, they had a fall one. And then this year, we continued the fall one again. And we will be having another one as well um, in the spring at the end of the year to, uh, for students to get together. And this was also a call. So parents also were stating that they really liked the idea of students being able to get together and being able to still socialize with one another, although they're not in the building. And the, the honor roll assemblies, I'm finding that the students really love uh, the the idea of having that their name called even is virtual on the screen and we just go through the full process of recognizing those students who make honor roll in their in their peers you know do the emojis you know for them showing their appreciation for it now so that that's really great i really enjoyed doing the honor roll assemblies and we do them we have done them every quarter and the one that i'm looking most forward to is now the move up ceremonies that we plan to have for the fifth and eighth grade and we will be having that at Tuscarora High School. So Tuscarora High School will be letting us use their auditorium in order to actually um, have a ceremony for our fifth and eighth grade. So they can have something that, you know, other students in brick and mortar have, that we can have something for them as well. So I'm really looking forward to that. And as you can see, we have a lot of different activities that we do for the students. And we do encourage them to participate in any programs that the schools do have. And, and of course, because of scheduling, sometimes they can't participate and everything that's at their home schools. So Dr. Samuels, I thought you were going to say your favorite thing was the Alex Pie Challenge. So I don't know if you want to share that at all, because we yes. talked about Alex previously, the math uh, program. Yes, yeah, so I, the students that were in algebra participated in the Alex Pie Challenge. And so what and so what they did, they completed, they had to complete it um, like the 3.14, they went through the whole process. And then at the end, we told them whoever was able to actually make their goals, we would give them a pie. And so what I ended up doing over pretty much over the, it was over the Christmas break, over the holiday, the winter break, that I drove around and I delivered individual pies to seven students who won the Alex Five. So they were so excited and I've never seen someone so excited to get a pie. And even the parents were like really grateful and thankful that I was able to make that um, make that trip for them. So yes, that was that was that was a great time. It was. And, and Mr. Wat Mr. Watson. Hi, good morning, everyone. Good morning, Ms. Johnson, Mr. J, and Mr. Bass. It's good to see you again. Um, as you know, uh, the Frederick County Virtual School has been offering virtual programs since 2011 to all of our Frederick County Public School High School students through either supplemental programs or full-time options. So I'm just going to kind of remind you of some of those programs that we have going on. Um, in our supplemental programs, we have over 54 comprehensive online courses. Um, we're always trying to add to our, um, our course catalog so that we can provide more flexible options to all of our students. For example, last year we started offering the Black African American Studies course. Um, we offered a Principle of Marketing, which added a CTE completer through all of our supplemental programs. This year we're offering biology and we're currently piloting our health two option for our high school students. 
Uh, next year, we're looking at adding an additional fine art credit and some AP courses to, again, just provide all of our high school students across the county some flexible options to their scheduling needs. Um, we do purchase content, um, but we have curriculum teams who review that content and use rubrics from Quality Matters, which is a national standard for evaluating online courses, to really identify and align the content with FCPS curriculum. Um, all of our programs have had some kind of synchronous in session, a synchronous um, component. That's a staple of all of our programs. We used to actually bring students into TJ Middle School in the evenings. Now we do all of those synchronous sessions virtually. Um, some of those can be as often as once a week, and some of those can be as little as once a month, depending on the program that the student is enrolled in. Uh, some of our programs like credit recovery, we offer additional support through a mentor who acts as really like an academic learning coach for students to help facilitate the learning process um, and give them access to another adult in addition to the teacher of record. One of the numbers that I'm really proud of, you can see there at the bottom, is that last year's graduates, the class of 2023, 32% of our students had taken at least one course through the virtual school at some time during their academic career. So we've been an option for students to take additional courses um, as well as attend their traditional high schools um, in Frederick County. Our school year programs, I'm not gonna overwhelm you with some of the acronyms listed there, but our first two programs are credit recovery. They're really designed to provide students an option to retake a course that they might've previously failed. We are working with the curriculum office to reevaluate our credit recovery options and kind of revamp them for the coming school years. We also have a virtual in-school option and those top three options um, really provide students some flexibility in their scheduling. Um, students enrolled in those programs have a block during their school day where they can go to the digital learning lab and work on their online course. And then we have our virtual outside of school program, which is really students who are taking additional courses beyond the four that they're taking each semester at, at the high school. Um, we offer elective options, um, honors level courses, AP courses, and you can see the number of students that access those programs and our success rate each year. We also offer our summer session programs. We've been doing summer learning options um, really since about 2010, 2011 as well. Uh, you see there first, we have a multilingual English 12 option that is in person. We do use um, virtual uh, courses as the backbone for instruction, but we do have daily support with the teacher of record and a multilingual um, teacher as well. We also have a support-based summer session, which is designed for credit recovery. Kids have access to a mentor on a daily basis. And then we have our virtual summer session program uh, which is kids who are taking classes for a variety of reasons to maybe save space in their schedule at their home schools, to take more dual enrollment courses, to enroll in CTC. And the virtual summer session is also open to rising ninth graders. So any student who's transitioning from eighth grade to ninth grade has access to some of those courses as well to get a, a head start on some of their high school credits for graduation. So we do have some full-time enrollment options. Um, we have a full-time enrollment option that used to be called Flexible Evening High School. And this was primarily designed as a dropout prevention program. So we still have students who will transfer to us from their home school who still need maybe five to eight credits to meet their graduation requirements. And for whatever reasons, they have life situations that prevent them from attending their traditional school. So to provide them some flexibility um, in navigating that, we have, we've used our supplemental programs to provide them those options and then provide um, mentor support in the evening as well as on weekends um, to meet their scheduling needs. And then, as you know, we also have the high school remote virtual program, um, which is meeting with students synchronously on a daily basis to provide instruction. Um, one of the things that as you're kind of reading these testimonials, I usually share with you students who have previously graduated. Uh, I decided to share with you two students that are currently enrolled that really kind of capitalize on our mission to provide high quality online programs that give students um, some flexibility in the time, place, path, and or pace of their learning. Um, this first one, Mason, is a is just phenomenal student. 
I mean, he's 17 years old and he owns his own business. Um, and he wants to be available for his customers from one o'clock um, on. So he needs some flexibility in his schedule. So he actually used a combination of CTC, a course in our remote virtual program, and some courses in our supplemental programs to be able to meet his needs and still run his business as a student at 17. And then the second one, we're seeing more and more students um, like Nola, who she has goals of being a division one student athlete. And so through some of her tennis competitions, she's traveling around the country um, during parts of the school year and having some flexibility to her schedule and some flexible options to access her courses. Um, she's able to do that and not be penalized and work on her courses from wherever she might be in the country on the times that she is traveling. So I'm sharing these two with you because I think this is where high school online learning in the future should start to provide more options for students, whether they're full time virtual or maybe even still enrolled in their homeschool, but looking some more flexible scheduling options. Um, so that's a summary of what's going on at the Frederick County Virtual School. Um, Happy to hear some comments and questions that you might have for either uh, Dr. Samuels or myself. And before we go there, can I, I forgot to make a point. I'm going to go back to slide four and Mike and Christine, I'm hoping you can help me with this. We were looking at the enrollment numbers and I think this is important for you all to know as well. These are the numbers projected at the beginning of the school year, but we have a rolling enrollment that goes on. And so each year we gain more students. So this is going to be the minimum number typically. Um, so Christine, do you have specific numbers in elementary this year that you've gained throughout the year? Uh, yes. With, with elementary, we started with, we started with 51 students in elementary. And I also just keep in mind, even though we start with 51 in elementary, we do have students who have returned back to school and came in. So it's been like both ways. Uh, and with and with middle school, we started we started with one one forty seven. So we start with one forty seven with the middle school, and we're currently at one fifty eight. Actually, that number for the middle school has ha has increased because we um, we enrolled during the fourth term an addition <coughs> excuse me an addition of seven students in middle school. And then, Mike, what about at the high school level? Is it more on the semester basis? It is, and and because of the, you know, the scheduling conflicts at the high school level really make it challenging for us to take students once the semester has started. It's a little bit more um, easy to navigate at the semester change because uh, we don't want students to lose credits. And at the high school level, Dr. Samuels talked about it. It's a little bit more compounded with. Um, what a student might be able to take at Tuscarora High School and then trying to transfer to the remote virtual program where we only have 19 teachers, like we're not able to offer as many courses as Tuscarora or any of our other high schools would be. So when that happens, we do utilize some of our supplemental programs um, to try to ensure that kids don't lose credits, but we don't see an increase of students throughout the school year. If anything, we probably see a little bit of a decrease. And I think some of it's because of those scheduling conflicts, because we're trying to meet synchronously for four blocks a day and follow kind of a traditional high school schedule. Thank you. And I apologize for going out of order. Now we'll be happy to take any questions you might have. I'm going to start with Mr. Uh, Jay, because I'm not sure your teaching schedule today. So we'll hit you first. Oh, thank you for that. Um, I wanted to actually uh, just commend the program. Um, as you may have known, I, I, I'm a big proponent of your program and trying to support you as much as I can. Um, I um, I am just uh, grateful for you for your uh, your rollout. And, and the fact that we had this program already set up when the pandemic hit, we were a lot more um, flexible and mobile than other, other districts. Um, it's a shame we didn't have our computer situation uh, as great as it was, but I'm glad we were able to work together with the um uh, County Executive um, Jan Gardner to get computers rolled out one to one for our, our schools. Um, just want to ask about access um, to home based schools. Um, I've talked with students who are from um, our uh, FCC program, the uh, early college program, and what they have in common with students who are in remote virtual is that they both have that um, they're not at the school, but they still have access to their school in a way. What I found is that it's hard for kids who are not um, in the building 
um, to get their their IDs or to um, be able to go in and come out when need be. If they were to go into the school, uh, I found that they actually they had, they were required to stay the whole time. So what can we do, um, you know, or, or what have you seen that maybe it's working where students have that flexibility to go in or maybe they're, they're, they're kind of notified? Because right now, uh, the word I used to receive is uh, talk to the counselor. But this isn't a proactive situation to where they are uh, notified Today is the day for, the day for school picture for the ID. Today you can come in by buy tickets for the prom. Today you can, you know, like we need to really streamline access for students who are off site but still enrolled. Because what I'm seeing is very, um, it's very choppy. It's not uniform. It's streamlined, and students, students are suffering. We have kids who do not have have their badges, their IDs, so they, they can't get the benefits of, of a student or get to movies or at an event or whatever, what have you, or even go to, um, you know access to things for school pictures how do we streamline that what are you guys seeing what have you seen that works well and what can we do to get that streamlined i'm going to let mike answer this in a moment because i think it's probably more of a high school issue going in during the school day but i would say that is also a compliment to our new security and unfortunately that's probably you know we have really made sure that our schools are secure and that only authorized people are going into the building and so we probably need to think through those kids who should have authorization to get into the buildings um, and how we can streamline that. So I'm going to turn it over to Mike, but I know that schools in the last two years all along, but have really done a lot to um, make sure that we are secure. And that makes it you know, problematic for a kid who might be dropping in unannounced. So I think that's something that we can probably think through processes. But Mike, do you have a thought? Yeah, so at the high school level, you know, it's really extracurricular activities like athletics and clubs, um, proms, homecomings, like those types of events. And so we do a couple things to encourage our full time students to stay kind of abreast to what's going on at their home schools. And that's, you know, first is like they're automatically still enrolled in find out first messages for their home school. So they're receiving those communications. In addition, a lot of our homeschools use Schoology as an additional messaging option. So, you know, for example, Oakdale High School might have like a, a student page in Schoology where they also share information about clubs and other additional opportunities or picture days. Um, sometimes those those groups are set up by grade level. So like I'll see a lot of like seniors, don't forget to pick up your caps and gowns. So I do think our homeschools do a lot to try to include students in that through some of that communication. At the high school level, um, Mr. J, I'm not sure how many of our students who choose virtual have a strong desire to go back to their building for some of those things. Like it's not as many as I would have originally thought when we started the remote virtual program. Many of them are choosing us because they, yeah, they don't have a desire to go into their home school for whatever reason that is. Um, and I, it's, it's, it's challenging for us, too, because, and Dr. Samuels can probably relate to this, too, like when in our student information system, when I go to look up a student, we're used to having the picture there. A lot of our remote virtual program students, they don't go in to get their picture taken. Um, they just choose not to. So we don't even have that. So it'd be interesting to find out like how many of them are choosing not to engage in those activities versus don't have access or knowledge to those activities. Um, but there are some things we're trying to do to encourage that. I'm not sure how much um, the dual or the, um, the early college students, I would imagine they're receiving the same thing, but um, I, don't, I don't have enough knowledge about like how they might receive that information to answer that question, Mr. J. But Mr. J, I can share that with um, Dr. Mirshaw, the high school director, so that she gets that feedback that um, there are some students who are feeling, you know, that they can't have easy access. And I'm sure the high school principals would be willing to kind of, you know, talk through what some solutions to that might be. Yeah, just in terms of what you mentioned there, like, um, thank you all for the feedback. But um, it all comes down to like... Um, uh, safety in general, because right now we, we have a need and there are kids who do want to have that connection or just ha have that access and we don't have a pathway for them. It's, it's really like it's, it's ad hoc and that, that's, that isn't safe and that isn't, you know, best practice. Um, so, yeah, just want to thank you for that. And then um, later on, I don't know who can get this to me. I mean, I have it with you right now, but I wonder what our um, graduation um, rates are for our students in the program. I'm sure it's uh, really high. I know the 
uh, virtual program uh, was first initialized to increase our rates of graduation. But just as, as it's going on, I want to see how that number uh, has continued on. But overall, I, I love the program. I thank you for the flexibility you, you provide us. Um, you make us nimble. Uh, you make us stronger. And you help us uh, make sure every, every child every day does happen. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. J. Mr. Bass. Thank you. Um, I think you've done a great job outlining the um, the ways that this program is a real asset to uh, Frederick County. And certainly um, I saw a lot of that um, in speaking at one of the graduation ceremonies um, for uh, for the virtual program. Um, but I, I do I do want to ask, are you seeing um, are you seeing any negatives? Um, I, I I worry about if we have any developmental concerns, maybe particularly for our elementary school students, um, if they're spending, if they're in the virtual program for several years, um, and then perhaps transitioning back to in-person, any developmental concerns for um, when they're back in person? Dr. Samuels, do you wanna take that? Or I know you have just your first year there, or would you like me to address that? I would like for you to address it as far as the development of needs, but I can address the, um, like from the parent perspective of what has been shared with me and how they feel. So I can do that part. Um, Sounds so, good. Okay, all right. So um, from the parent perspective of the students in the elementary program, they just continue to think that there's not, um, there's no barrier um, for them in regarding as far as their developmental because they feel like they are there with their child and they can hear some of the, um, you know, the information that the teacher is teaching the kids so they can actually also reinforce with their child as well. So for the parents who have shared that with me, they haven't shared any, you know, developmental concerns on, on their part for their child. And, and most of the parents that have been talking to me, their students have been in the uh, remote virtual since, you know, it started since right after COVID. And so I can share it with those. But other than that, I don't have any other information as far as to share with that. And then Mr. Bass, Ms. Canning, who is one of the elementary directors and I were the people that were responsible for supervising the program last year. And we felt very comfortable with the program going from first to third, because I think there were some concerns around making sure that, as we were talking earlier, that all these connections, but the reading program, really helping kids learn how to read virtually is sometimes, you know, a challenge. And so third graders really seemed, and I think that matches national research that virtual programs in other places start middle of elementary school and not at the foundational beginning part. So I think we were very comfortable with the program going from third to eighth, um, just for that reason, because of the developmental concerns and the really create the fundamental need to make sure kids have a strong reading foundation. Sounds to me that you have found a good balance, um, uh, including on the academic side. Um, yeah, I, I, um, I, I sometimes just worry on, on the social side um, whether kids are developing the, I don't know, um, uh, good ability to interact with each other, make friends, and um, really connect with each other in person. All that said, I, it's really important that we continue this this virtual program. I think it's a real asset for a variety of individual needs. Um, but yeah, it's there is that social piece that I um, that I do worry about a little and I, I just hope we're we're staying conscious of. And to your point, if I could just jump in what I agree with you, and that's why Dr. Samuels has expanded what Dr. Vetter had done the year before. Um, and that's why we shared all of those social interactions, because especially upper elementary and middle school, we know how important social interaction is and not and particularly those that at that age group, they're not particularly skilled at um, interactions. So the more that we can help them have interactions and provide just in time feedback about appropriateness, being kind, you know, what are all those skills that are necessary and sometimes show their, you know, their struggles in middle school in particular, we appreciate what you're saying. And that's why we increase the number of social activities so that we can try to do that as best we can. Yeah, thank you.
Okay. Um, I, I'm, I'll just go ahead and jump in and I uh, want to thank you for the presentation. And I think it's super important that we keep this program. I know I, I reluctantly voted to um, eliminate the early elementary grades. And uh, again, I think if, if, if the budget, depending on our budget situation, um, you know, we would, I don't know what potentially would happen with our, um, virtual school programming, uh, and uh, virtual school and virtual program. But I think it's super important. And I, I certainly don't mind being a leader in the state in this area. Uh, I express the same concerns about ensuring that our students maintain social relationships while they're in the program. Uh, I happen to be personal friends with one of the teachers in the program. And so I get regular feedback on how things are going. And, um, you know, someone who, is a practitioner of teaching virtually. Um, you, you know, Mr. Bash, we're talking about some of the social aspects. I, I know one of my classes that's completely online has a better core relationship amongst the class than the class I meet face to face. So, um, so I think again, if we, if we can continue to focus on ensuring that our learning priorities and the development of our students is, is what's at the forefront, um, then, uh, you know, I'd like to just keep in trying to enhance this, this program, um, focusing on the quality. You know, I think we have quality already, but I think high quality is, is a game changer in this. And, uh, and so that would be like a stake in the stand. I, I, I would put that, you know, whatever we're offering is going to be extremely high quality. So thank you for all, all your efforts and that everyone's putting forth on this. Thank you so much for the great feedback. We appreciate you and don't envy the budget in the discussions you're going to have to have. Mm. Okay. All Wait, right. Mr. Thank you, team. Yeah. I'm going to put punt back over to you, Mr. Murphy. <laughs> yeah. I think um, the last item would just be to preview next month. It's actually just in a few weeks on May the 1st. Two items as scheduled, the multilingual education program update. Um, as well as a presentation on personalized learning and the work of our innovation team. Mm -hmm. um, if it works for the board members on this committee, we would like to propose adding a third item that day, which would be a quick update um, on a new proposed pathway in CTE. Um, it actually responds to one of the questions from last month. Uh, there was a question about how we're partnering around emergency services and cadet programs. We actually had some things in the works that um, if we're able to get to the committee for a quick presentation next month, we could get some things to the full board that would open up uh, some access quickly. So we'd like to add that item if it works for you all. Uh, it's certainly no problem with me, Mr. Bass. It works. Thank yeah. you. Um, I, I, I may not be able to hear the whole presentation, but I do uh, I, I support it being on the agenda. Thank you. Okay. Ms. Raines, anything else on agenda setting? Uh, no, I think that covers it. Thank you. Thank you. And I, I just before we end, do we? I can't remember when the boardroom is supposed to open back up. Do we know where we're at with our timeline on that? It, um, earlier today, I was told that a meeting on May seventh might need to be changed. You know, from the boardroom. So I'm thinking because our next meeting's May first. Okay. I'm thinking we might need to be virtual again that meeting. Okay, so we'll just state publicly here that we'll prepare for virtual. Uh, you know, set expectations. Uh, we'll prepare for virtual, but if by some possibility we can meet in person, that would be the preference uh, of, of of me as the the board liaison to to this committee. So, um, so the the soonest opportunity we have to go back to uh, in person meeting, uh, I, I will take. So, okay, thank you. That's it on our end. Okay, thanks everybody. Have a great rest of your day. See, you. see some of you later. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Take care.